Hi everyone, my name's Margaret Bremner. I have my colleague Amita Prakash with me. I'm just going to run you through some of what we teach in our EndNote class for beginners. So what we'd like to do is show you how to create a new library and manage it and how to add references using manual, direct export from Google Scholar and from ProQuest. Importing PDF files we will discuss how to manage and how to get an output from EndNote. EndNote is a database manager and much of what we normally teach talks about how good it is as doing citations, but it's really useful because it allows you to create your own library, which means that you can do all those searches that you need in your own stuff. It is a sophisticated citation creator, so it enables you to insert citations in your writing, and it can do this with a number of different applications. We're going to be using Microsoft Word. It is also a bibliography and or reference list creator, so it can format and produce your reference list in the style that you require for your assignments. So here's just an expression of, a visual expression of what we're talking about here. It's the different ways that we can get information in and the outputs that we can get. When we teach this, originally I stopped teaching about referencing and then I realised that many of our postgraduates are international students and don't necessarily know about the four main elements in referencing, which is the who wrote it, when was it written, what did they write and where was it published? So I created these extra couple of slides which give people an idea of who belongs where when you're putting information into EndNote. Now, the other thing to be aware of is that in EndNote, a referencing style is known as an output style. It comes pre-installed with 491 styles. There are over 6,000 styles available on the EndNote website. You'll also find that some of the big publishers have created their own styles and you can find those on their pages. So I know that Springer and um, some of the Elsevier journals have their own EndNote output styles that you can go looking for. They aren't necessarily on that EndNote page. So we're just going to talk about some of the things that we try and teach to reduce issues for students. So we're talking about best practice. Um, the first thing that we say is you need to take care with your input because your input determines your output. EndNote is a what you see is what you get. So if you're not accurate when you're inputting, then you're going to get garbage out. This was uh, one of the ones that we get the most queries on is author names. Students tend to not look at the fact that one author can put can publish under different configurations of their names. So in this case, you've got a John James Smith who has published in four different ways. EndNote will consider them as four different authors. So sometimes you need to do the research about an author in case they have similar author names. And here is a classic from one of our professors. He has an ORCID ID, and this was really handy to find because this really showed students the difference. So Sydney is a um, prolific author. He's got over 150 works, but he publishes under different configurations. Um, if I was putting Sydney into an EndNote library, I would be using the Sydney WA Decker just because it should cover everything else as well. Realising that author names are normally put in last name, then first name. Now, in next thing we'll want to be aware of is that an EndNote library consists of two files. You need to always keep these two files together. 
So here we recommend that you create a new folder and put the two files into that because then you're not going to have one just disappear. Uh, otherwise you're looking for either the ENL or the data file. The other thing to be very aware of is that you cannot save this library in a cloud or on a network. So it needs to be on the hard drive of the computer. It doesn't sync properly if you do it that way and eventually it can corrupt the file if it's on a network or in a cloud drive. The one thing that you can do is create backups. So we recommend compressing and archiving the library, giving the liar this compressed file a date and a library name and we suggest to our students that they do this fortnightly when they're doing their PhDs, otherwise they could lose things. Interestingly, this compressed library can be saved in the cloud, but you have to download it onto your computer and before you open it. So it's a really useful thing and I have used it recently with an academic who was having issues who had been using one of the syncing ones and not using sync online at all. And it was turning up on both computers, but not accurately. So we went back to her compressed library and set her up with syncing with EndNote. Now the next thing to be aware of is the EndNote resources online. I think this has actually changed looks a little bit since I took this screenshot, but there is a YouTube channel. Um, Clarivate do some really good work on their EndNote videos. So a couple of other things. We recommend the use of one library with the use of group sets and groups to enable students to manage all of the work that they have coming in. If they have more than one library, you can end up with issues where they have already inserted citations from both libraries or all of their libraries into the one document. And that can get really confusing for them and for us when we're trying to fix it. Um, from here, I'm going to go and show you how to actually use EndNote. So for those wanting to work along, if you exit the full screen in the view options in Zoom, then you can resize the windows so that you can uh, work along if that's what you'd like to do. Otherwise, I'm just going to work in EndNote. So this is my existing EndNote library. It's not very big. This is one I use for training. So what I'm going to do first is show you how to add a, a reference. Now, just in case people haven't worked it out, I'm working on a Mac. This is my preferred um, computer to use. I just find it suits me much better than working on a Windows machine. There are three ways to get a new reference window in EndNote. You can go to this little icon here, which adds a new reference. You can go to references, new reference, and you can on a Mac go command N and it creates a window. So the default for a window for a reference on um, EndNote is a journal article. So I'm actually going to change this to a book, so there's a drop down here, and I'm going to say that I'm working on a book. At this point, all I'm doing is putting in enough information so that you can see how it works. So if I put in my last name, a comma, and then put in my first name, and I'm gonna put in my middle initial, because I'm likely to have published under Bremner, 
MB or Bremner Margaret Bean, not likely to have published up under my full name. That's just me. I'm going to put a meter in as well. Now, the one that a lot of people have problems with is when you get a corporation or a government department. In this case, I'm actually going to say that we've published this with Griffith University of one, as one of the authors as well. To get EndNote to treat Griffith University like a last name so that it actually puts all of it there, you just need to put a comma after Griffith University. It will make EndNote treat it like a last name. The other one that people sometimes have problems with is, say, a government department. And it's the Commonwealth of Australia. At this point, this would look really strange if we didn't put in some punctuation. And we actually just need to put two commas there. Now, it, we're publishing this this year, and we just happen to be writing about EndNote. Now, it's being published at South Brisbane. And the publisher is going to be Griffith University. Now, all I need to do is close this window. And I can close this window just by clicking on that button. Now, uh, in this case, for me, I've used this computer before. And it did not ask me if I wanted to save. It just automatically did it for me. Now, on a Mac, you have an advantage because you have this window, which is where all of the information is stored, but you can see the referencing fields here and at the bottom, you can see the preview of what it's going to look like in your reference list. This is one of the reasons I like using a Mac because you can always see this preview. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is layouts. EndNote has specific layouts. Mine is currently set as a right split. I'm having up on the up in this section of the page, you can change that to either just a right or a bottom or a bottom split so that you can make it so that you can see a number of other things. Like this. So mine's a right split. If I did a bottom split, it will look like this and it will allow me to have that like that. As I said, I prefer a right split. I give students who may come from a country where the language is written from right to left, the option because sometimes they will be better off if it's at the bottom. Now, the next thing I'm going to teach is how to get some information from Google Scholar and databases. And the first thing to be aware of is that Clarivate recommends using Firefox. It just has a better interaction with EndNote. So if I go into Firefox, I have Google Scholar set up. Up here on the left hand side, there's a little menu in Google Scholar. And if you click on that, you can go into settings. And settings is really useful because you can show links to import citations into EndNote. And I have already done that and saved it on my computer. So you have the choice of a few different references. The other thing for people in your um, universities to be aware of is that they can set up library access links for up to five libraries. At Griffith, it is normally these three. 
it means that when they do a search, it will automatically show them if the university that they are at has access to those files. Now, I'm only going to do a simple search. And I'm going to do one on information literacy. It's something that I do a regular search on just to see what comes up. Now, there's a couple of other things. At the moment, I'm currently um, signed into Google. Because I'm signed into Google, I can click on these little stars. And the little stars will go dark. And it's created for me the opportunity to go in to my library. So if I click on my library, it gives me all the information that I've put in there, which includes some stuff I did last time. If I click on here and then go over here, I can export to EndNote and export a large number all in one. On a Mac, it will then bring up this window and I can open it with and choose which application I want to open it with. It happens to be EndNote 18. Go like that and go open and just go OK. So in my EndNote, I've now imported 10 references. Now, we would normally suggest that students do regular editing. In EndNote 18, we had the opportunity, they gave us this lovely little extra of recently added, um, which comes in once you've imported your next things. And you can determine how long you want to keep things in there and it means you can do one large edit. So in my all references, I now have all of these. So the next thing I'm going to go and do is get something out of ProQuest. Now, oh, you can import one at a time, which is also really useful if that's all you want. So if I go back to here, there is the ability to just import one at a time. So it will still go through the same process and bring it in for me. Okay? Your computer starts to learn what it can do. Um, now I'm going to go into ProQuest. Now I've gone via our catalogue so that I could see it. And I'm going to do the same basic search in here. It, this is a multidisciplinary database and if I do information literacy and I'm not doing anything clever with this to make it better I might say that I want peer-reviewed and I'm just going to do this ah so we have a problems with basic search Okay. Now, ProQuest runs slightly differently to Google Scholar, but not a great deal. So the first thing to be aware of is that you can tick boxes. And as you tick boxes down here, it adds items to the little folder up the top. So I'm just going to get a couple of things from here. and go back up to my folder up here, click on it and open it. 
this is where things become a little bit different in um, databases. One would think that you would go to site, but in this case, you actually go to save and you're going to export a risk file. You can say what it is you would like in that risk file and you just go continue. It's in progress. I have used this a couple of times and as you can see, it says open with. Sometimes this has something else in there. I've set it up to do it automatically and I just go okay. And I have another four items in my reference library now. Now, in some databases, they come out as TXT files, and sometimes you have to import those things, or you might need to use a connection file. We don't actually talk about those at introductory level, but we do show people how to import PDFs. But at this point, what I'm going to show, because one of my colleagues turned my ideas around a little bit, and what she does once you've entered a couple of references is she goes into Word. And by going at this point, students are starting to learn that they can do more things as they go along. Now, you go to the EndNote tab and you hit Insert Citation. It brings up the library that you have been working on. And at this point, you can choose, actually, you can either put an A into this field here or you can put a star. Both of those will bring up all of your library. You can choose to put in one reference like this and note that it brings directly underneath it and it's this stage called a bibliography which it's not going to be. It brings this directly here so the first thing I tell students to do when they've put their first reference in is to insert a page break so that they're reference list is not sitting right up underneath their other work because sometimes you see students put it right up under there and they'll start typing underneath it. Now there is a way to enter multiple authors at the same time, multiple documents So we want to cite from more than one document. If we go back to that insert citation and we can hold down the control key or the command key on an Apple machine and just go insert. And if you look down the bottom, the reference list has got quite a bit longer. So that's using Word and Cite While You Write. The other things that we wanted to show you were to do with um, just a couple of little things that I have worked out for our researchers because we tend to be teaching this to researchers is that what I've noticed is that we tend to get two different two main types of researchers so we have researchers who will go out and conduct research they'll export their references from either Google Scholar or databases or from the, the library catalogues and they export it, bring it into EndNote, they haven't got anything attached to it. 
and we recommend that at that point they go and find the full, use find full text to import PDFs and that they will need to edit their reference. The other type of researcher that we find is somebody who does research and they like to download the PDFs as they go along. They can then import their PDFs as in single files or folders, because many of these people come along to our sessions and they've already started collecting. Or you can set up a default folder to download the PDFs to. The issues with this is that not all PDFs bring the metadata. So you might need to put a little bit of information in and then run reference updates and see if you can get the information that way. And then you'll still need to edit the reference. So, when I talk about going out and looking for um, the PDFs, if you look at some of your works and see if they have, in particular, a DOI. So something like this, then you can go to references, find full text, find full text. It will ask you to log into the university that you're at. It will, in our case, it goes to our databases page. And we just need to hit continue. And over here on the left hand side, you can see that it's gone out searching. So that could take a little while to find it. So I'm actually going to do a couple at the same time. So it's now going searching for five items. So it's going to take a little while. Now, when I talk about reference updates and you've imported a PDF, a reference update would be going to something like this, which doesn't have a DOI. It's got a reasonable amount of information and just go and find reference updates. There might be more information out there. Now for this to work properly, you need to be using EndNote 18.01 or more or greater. Before that, it has an old crossref file in it. So it relies on a crossref connection file. Um, and it was updated in the last uh, 12 months. So here you can see that there are things that could be changed. So it has found some information. So the first thing I can see is that it wants to go down to just having uh, capital letters and I actually want to keep mine. So I don't want to update all fields. I might want to update empty fields but in this case I can just click on edit the reference which means that if I take the information from here, I can update just the pieces I want. And it's actually found a DOI for me, which is really useful. It might need to, you can edit that to just being the numbers. It's got all this information on keywords and the abstract. And these are really useful if a researcher is going to be wanting to know whether they need to read it all or not. It does give you more information and in many cases, I'll keep that. But I'm going to go save and continue. And that's up to date. It's being very slow searching. 
I'm just going to check that we actually have the fine full text preferences in here. We have. So to do that, you noticed I went on a Mac to EndNote and then Preferences. So I'll show that again. We go to under the EndNote here and Preferences. And this is where you can make a lot of changes to things, including I mentioned a PDF auto import folder. So you can set up a folder and select it. So if you are downloading PDFs, it will go directly into that folder. And every time you open EndNote, it will bring in what's sitting in there. So as part of my information, I have, I'm going to supply this for everyone. This is where that new Crossref connection file is. So as it says, if you're running 18.0.1, you're not going to need it because it will already be in there. But you might need to update this connection file. Um, on a Mac, that just means going into EndNote going into the libraries, so it would be actually going. Going into the hard drive, applications, EndNote 18 and you have connection files here. So you would take out the old one and put a new one in. Now, the next thing we wanted to talk about was groups and group sets. So group sets are really useful because you can set them up in genres or themes. You can be really simple and just make it chapters. So you have the opportunity over here to determine what goes where. So it's like sitting down with a filing cabinet and saying, well, I want to use these things, these articles in this particular filing cabinet and these articles in another one. So a group set is like a filing cabinet. A group is like the actual file that you keep in there, sections of it. So you can add group sets and you can add groups to each of your group sets. So I suggest to researchers that they, at the very beginning, think about what they're wanting to look at in their thesis and how they can determine the best layout for their EndNote, but that this is not set in stone because you can always delete it and start again. Preferably not when you've got a thousand references already in there. But all you need to do is right click and create a group set. And you name it. And I'm going to make mine really simple and just say that this is chapter one. And underneath that group set, you can now put in a group. And in this group, I'm going to be talking about bats. Now, in my references, I know that there's one about bats. I just have to find it. So I want to look at it, and it's in the title, I think, and it has bats. Oh, it's not in there. Must be... I can pretend, I will actually change that title of that to EndNote. If I go to all my references, I know that this one's about EndNote. So if I click on it, hold it down, and I can drag it over into that group. That's one way of doing things. But another way is 
when a researcher has been researching for a couple of years and they might have a thousand or two thousand references in their library and they've suddenly got another thought but they don't know some of these references they haven't actually looked at for a couple of years what we suggest is they create for themselves a little smart group and they can give their smart group its own little name And you can search any field in your EndNote library via this little smart group. Or you can search any field plus the PDF with the notes, which means it will actually go and look at the PDF, the ones that it can read. And I'm just going to create one that's about information. I'm not going to be any cleverer than this, but you can decide to do it by decade or by year so that you can change some of this stuff. These are drop downs. So if I create that, my EndNote crashed. Please excuse, the Mac's a little bit tired. And it didn't come back very well either. So I'm going to try again and create a smart group. And it's crashed again. It doesn't like it at the moment. Please excuse the um, Mac had an update last week, so it's playing up a little bit. But you get the idea of what it can do. Now, a couple of other things to be aware of that can be really useful. You can do searches in your library by using this search version here, which you will find the information on how to hide and show over in under layout. You can determine what you would like to keep here Oh, look, the, the new smart group actually worked. You can right click on any of these and determine what items you actually want sitting up the top. Now, I'm just going to show you one in particular, which is the rating button. The rating, a lot of people can't see why it's useful. Um, I queried it for a long time. I have a daughter who did honours a few years ago. And for her three years of her undergraduate degree, she kept saying, it's not much use me using EndNote. I've got a specialist output and EndNote doesn't have it as an output style. Beginning of honours, I said, you do realise you would have had a database of everything you've touched. And she sat down and entered everything over two weeks so that she had a database of everything she'd touched in three years. But what she used the rating for was when somebody's doing a literature review and they need to talk about the best articles they found and the worst articles they found and why, she found that she could say, well, this was a really good article. And this one here was a one star. And it meant that she could then do a few and you can sort by the number of stars. And she found that really useful when she was doing her literature review because she could see which ones were the good ones and which ones weren't. She'd already put some notes in, in the field for notes or research notes. Now, both of these 
will take up to 16 pages of text. So it's a really useful spot for somebody to be putting those little research notes. And it meant that she had the information she needed to write her literature review without having to go reading everything again. Now, the other thing that is really useful is that you can actually format this reference list. Now, we're using APA 6. If we go into under the bibliography and go to where it says configure bibliography, it brings up a new window. We recommend that you don't touch anything on this first tab, but on the second screen, you can format the layout. Now for APA 6, you are expected to use Times New Roman. So you can go down and choose Times New Roman. We don't actually want to call it a bibliography. It needs to be a references. The line spacing in APA 6 is double and it has a hanging indent. So if I click OK, it changes it to APA style reference list. It's really useful for students. Now, if a student has already entered items in and they've decided that they don't actually need to be citing Carling Jenkins, they go into edit and manage citations. They can go here and remove the citation. And this is the recommended way of removing a citation from the text. And just go OK. In this case here, we actually want to put a page number in. We're going to go back to edit and manage citations. And because APA allows you to do this, we're going to put in page 45. Just click OK and it will put it in, including the P dot. It's really useful. Now the other things that you might come across is that you want to use an author at the beginning of a sentence. Now, the better way to do this would be to insert the citation and display as author year. So I can take out what I typed in and you can see it's got it as all of it in one go. The other thing that people don't realise you can do with EndNote is actually create a bibliography. And there are two ways to do this. I'll show you the one that I found the easiest, which is to go into insert EndNote. I'm going to want everything that's sitting in my library. And if I highlight everything, which in this case is command A, it's highlighted everything. Going down to the insert button, you can go here and insert in bibliography only. So it's updated the in text and it's created a very long bibliography. And this is really useful because it's when you find out that you've got um, some things in there that aren't correct and you can go back and edit them. Now that's all I wanted to teach today. It's the only other thing that, that was on my top of my list was I've imported data into my library, but it's not showing up the journal correctly. So, in here, you can see that the uh, the journal title in here is Biol Cyburn, but you'll note that I've actually got it outputting correctly in the um, previews page. And how I did that was I actually changed the journal list. So in behind EndNote, you have an author list a journal list and a keyword list. And you can open this by going into tools. 
So I'm going to go into the journals term list. And what I did was I deleted what was originally there and imported a whole heap of journals that are in the biological sciences. So you can see that it has the full journal name in the left hand and the different ways that they can be abbreviated when they're asked for under specific um, referencing styles. And to do that, I just went in here, I deleted this list. I recreated it and noted that it was a journal list. I went OK. Now, I wanted to import information into here without having to do each one separately. So I went into my EndNote file and you'll note it's got terms here. So I went here and I chose that journal list, it imported them and I added 6,000 odd journals into my journal list, which means that everything in here now that is a biological science one will actually come out correctly. So I'm just going to have a little check of this. That one hasn't, that's in a different field. So I could go back in and import another journal list. And you can have more than one journal list imported into this here. So if I open up my journals list again, go back here, I can import more information into here. I'm going to try medical because that's what it could be. So it puts the two lists together. That was another 13,000 journals. And now if I actually look at the terms, you can see all of the extra information that's come in. And I can just close that. Now, seems strange, but it's like everything else. Shut it down, start it up again. And it, if that was the correct one, it will now show. And there you see it currently has the journal in here as J Intellect Dev Disabil. But in the preview, it's showing as Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disability, which is how it needs to show in your reference list. And that's all I was going to discuss today. Has anyone got any questions? Then just use chat to do that. Do you have any? And the other thing I wanted to then if, right, if there's no questions. If there are no questions, does anybody have any tips and tricks they'd like to share that they've had problems with? Ah.
machine couldn't let me open. Uh, Jackie's question is about um, why would the option to back up a compressed library not display? We're just wondering if the library is open. If the library is open, if the library is not open, it well, might not show. And the library was open. Okay. PC. No, I'm not sure. We can go and do some research, Jackie, if you'd like, on that question about a PC. This is how we deal with our students. Jackie, can you send me your email address, please? Thank you. Any other things that people have been having trouble with? Or things that they have had trouble with and then gone out and found the answer to? Because we'd all like to learn some new things. Yeah. Uh, the connection file for Primo, Bernadette, we'll go looking for that as well. Anyone else? If you don't see everything in there, Bernadette, if you typed in an A and then hit enter, because that should bring up everything in your library. So you can use an A or an asterisk to get all of your library. Yeah. And press enter. Are there any other questions? Or are we able to finish an hour early? Thanks, Marvin. So we'll go looking for the connection file for Primo for you if we can find one. And I'll look up that compressed library issue for you, Jackie. Lovely to see you all here today. And I think that Rachel can finish the meeting. Oops.